Welcome, this is gonna be a talk focusing on workflows, um, how to translate, how, how some software we've written can translate workflows between specifications. How's this? Let's do it like that. <laughs> okay. No, I might just hold it. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, um, this talk is about translating workflows between specifications with the tool that we've created called Janus. Um, and not only that, we're trying to maybe help some people that are current Galaxy users, um, but also hopefully expose some new users to Galaxy in the process. So workflow systems are kind of like tools themselves, you know. The main thing is that they, they have inputs, they do some processing and they, and they have outputs. And during the processing, it's not just one thing that's running, it's like a series of steps and they might have parallelization or something like that. So you have some like input data, you run your workflow and you produce outputs. So a lot of us here are familiar with galaxies. So you know, you'd be used to having galaxy workflows and same here. I have like about 20 Galaxy workflows that I use regularly, and that's where I always start. So I always start with Galaxy, and then only if I kind of have to, for some reason, I might think about another solution. But yeah, all these workflows systems are really quite the same. Um, you could write Nextflow for the same workflow that you could write Galaxy. They all have different features, um, and I wish I hadn't just like jump scare revealed that. But I'm about to say something controversial. There's no best programming language. There's no best workflow system. Okay, good. No riots. That's, that's good. Um, workflow systems, they kind of each just serve a community. They have different features and they have different purpose. And it's just kind of like picking the right tool for the right task. One of the issues, though, is that the space is pretty divided, which there's probably no real good solution for this. Um, it's just a matter of mainly familiarity. Like if you're really familiar with Galaxy, that's probably what you use. If you're really familiar with Nextflow, you know, you really wanna work within Nextflow because that's where you're most comfortable. It's also a big investment in time and skill and money really to train staff or something like that if, if you want to switch from using one workflow spec to another different one. This does present some issues though. For example, like let's say you, you wanna run a specific workflow and you find one on Workflow Hub and it's absolutely perfect, but maybe it's like WDL and your group uses CWL. You might be like, ah, that kind of sucks. Um, especially if you have to make some small adaptations to it, you might just kind of rewrite it in CWL. It also presents some issues when you have collaboration attempts where you're maybe a few different institutes or your partners are using a different workflow spec. And so some, you have to kind of choose, okay, which workflow spec are we gonna go with in this situation? And there's kind of no winners there. So back in 2018, we actually had this exact kind of issue we ran into. Um, there was a group of institutes in Melbourne, in Parkville, who wanted some cancer pipelines, um, but all of the different institutes involved, they were using different specs. So some of them had CWL, some of them WDL, and some of them were using Python scripts. And so as a solution, um, a tool called Janus was created. Um, it's a Python framework for writing workflows, which can then translate out to different specs. So it could translate out to WDL and it could translate out to CWL. And one of the benefits was, of this was the different groups involved, they didn't have to change like their HPC setups or anything like that. Um, just had one source of truth, which was the Python workflow, and then they could take that transpile it out to the language they use, and then run it on their systems. After a little bit of time, uh, Nextflow Translate was also added because it was becoming really, really popular. And around the same time that Nextflow Translate was being developed, I actually jumped on the team. Previous to that, I'd been working on Galaxy, do, doing tool wrappers. Um, and at that time, we kind of wanted more tools and workflows in Janus that we could transpile out to different specs. And so I kind of proposed the idea, well, why don't we use Galaxy as a kind of reference in some way? Now, if Galaxy had 
20 tools. What we probably would have done is we would have written it all manually in Janus, all these different uh, tools and workflows. But Galaxy doesn't have 20 tools and doesn't have 20 workflows, it has thousands, literally thousands. And so we thought, okay, maybe instead of like writing these out manually, maybe we could automatically pass the Galaxy tool XML and Galaxy workflows to generate the Janus for us. And so we created our an ingest, ingest unit where we could take Galaxy and ingest that into Janus. Currently, we have, like fast forwarding to now, we've got a few other ingest units, so we can kind of pass tools and workflows from different specs into Janus, um, which expands that ecosystem, and then we could translate them out when we need them as well. But once we had ingest units, we kind of realized we could actually do end-to-end -end translations. We don't really need the Janus in the middle. It can just be a middleman. And so what you can do now is if you have a Galaxy workflow, for example, you could take that workflow or tool, run Janus Translate, which is our new feature. It will ingest the Galaxy into an in-memory representation in Janus. And for example, if it's workflow, all those tools will be discovered in the workflow and translated to. And that's just like an in-memory representation. And then if you specified you wanted to go out to Nextflow, then it would transpile to Nextflow and write it to file. So as an example, I've just you know, got a history, a workflow here, which is unicycle assembly. And what I do is download that, so the .ga file. And then once, once I have that on the command line, I can use Janus Translate and I say, Janus translate dash dash from, that's where you're going from, dash dash to, next flow, that's where you want to translate out to, and then you point it to the direction where the file is. And what that will produce is, is some next flow, which is supposed to be like an equivalent workflow. What gets output is a folder, because of course, if you're translating workflow, you've got tools, you've got workflows, sub workflows, you've maybe got some supporting scripts, that kind of thing, config. And so it comes out in this folder, this translated folder. The main file is kind of like your normal next, your, your normal Galaxy workflow that you were seeing in the workflow editor. Modules contains all of the tool wrappers that were discovered and translated. Nextflow config is the inputs and some other stuff like maybe config for running on singularity. We have another folder called source, which is where we place Galaxy wrappers, just so that users can have a look at those um, in case the translation wasn't fully complete for some reason. And then sub workflows for sub workflows and templates for stuff like scripts or like scripts in the tool directory um, or config files. We handle inputs in nextflow.config, so that's kind of like your core workflow inputs. The main workflow file there, it's just, you know, classic Nextflow. We've got some imports from the modules. These are the tools that have become Nextflow processes, declaring some variables, and then we start the workflow. And then each tool will be its own Nextflow process in the modules folder. Talking about some, like, limitations of this feature we have, it's quite hard to actually translate between all of these specs because you have to support all of them. And they have really different competing paradigms and things that they support. For example, with Galaxy, you can write Python code, you know, Cheetah, um, and that's completely ar arbitrary. You know, you can write pretty much whatever you want. In CWL, they have JavaScript, and Nextflow has Groovy or Java, completely arbitrary. So even just translating expressions is, is very difficult, and that's still a challenge for us. But just focusing on the params, the Galaxy params and freeform cheetah processing, this also can be a bit tricky for a parser to work out, you know, what's the actual underlying software. Of course, in Galaxy, um, params have two jobs. One job is to supply data into the actual command in the command section. But the other job is to render a nice, tidy UI. And that's kind of the preference. So sometimes sacrifices are made so that it's very clean on the front end um, and in the back end it's a little bit more tricky so what we're doing when we pass these files is we actually 
we kind of started thinking, okay, the params are the inputs to the tool, but we realized that's not the case. There's a lot of pre-processing and stuff that happens within the tool command. And what we're actually looking for is in this command body of the tool XML, what we're looking for is the actual software command, like for example, fast QC and then arguments, flags, positionals, that kind of thing. It's quite tricky though, because it's kind of spread out. It's distributed throughout the whole command and a lot of the values can be are calculated dynamically. So what we're trying to do is pass this, work out what the actual software command is inside the Galaxy command section. And then for example, in cases like this, we want to link the parameters to the arguments that the command has. So looking at this one, we've got contaminants, which is a list of contaminants. This is fast QC. Um, and that renders out really nicely in the UI. And when we actually look at where it's referenced in the command section, it's pretty clear what it does. It's, it's an option, it's got a prefix and a value. We can see the contaminants param is referenced. And so we know that that, that actually is a direct link to the input parameter. So when we're passing our workflow and we've got this, uh, we, we pass the tool state for the workflow step and it says, uh, here's the contaminants file. We know, okay, that's actually related to the dash dash contaminants option in FastQC. It gets a lot trickier with other inputs. Um, for example, the input file for FastQC can be a bunch of different types and it appears throughout the command section in a lot of different places. So there's a lot of stuff going on here, but the thing I want you to take away from it is there's really no direct link between that parameter and where it appears on the command line. It actually, when you see on the command line, just down here, it's no longer what it started with. This, here it's referenced this input file and here it's input file SL. And that's because we've done some pre-processing on that. So because there's no direct link, things become quite tricky. Cheetah is meant to be kind of resolved at runtime with real data. And so the kind of cheetah gets resolved and then we actually have values for everything, but we're passing these files statically and we don't have input data. So when, for example, it's looking at the data type of the input data and trying to work out what it should do, um, that's quite tricky for us because we're never gonna have the data. We, we pass these files statically. That said, um, we do know that stuff like this happens. And so we actually have, in this case, a system of aliases and this gets passed fine. It does know that input file SL is referencing that parameter. But this is kind of just to explain that Galaxy tool XML can be quite compl complicated. And so in some cases, the translation isn't perfect. Um, but a lot of the time it's pretty close. If we were to take FastQC and translate with Janus Translate to Nextflow, get something out like this. Um, the thing, some of the things I want to focus on just quickly with this is that we're doing a couple of things in the back end for you so that it actually is kind of like a running process. For example, we get, we always check if there's a valid container for the software requirements on Quay.io. So we make some API calls to get this tool in the first place. We make toolshed API calls to actually look at the wrapper that's referenced in the workflow and then download it. And then we actually load up a mock galaxy to then uh, load up the XML, so a kind of running Galaxy as we translate, which is kind of fun. But yeah, when there's a single requirement, we just look up quay.io uh, and grab the relevant container. But if there's multiple requirements, we use the Galaxy mold build toolkit to generate a new container on the fly based on the, um, the different requirements that, that tool needs. And you'll see that when we actually, just as a little fun thing, when we translate this to next slide, we, we do actually understand that that, you know, input file appears last and it's that one. So we've, we've made that connection. You can also translate to CWL, but we're just focusing on next slide today. So yeah, basically with this Galaxy next slide translation, you can expect that the workflow structure is correct. Uh, simple tools will have a completely valid translation and complex tools might have some adjustment. I'm looking at you, HiSat too. That's a challenging one. So yeah, it really depends on the complexity of tool wrappers, but at the end of the day, you at least get all the structure and you get all your processes nicely templated out and maybe you need to fix them up in a, a couple spots. So yeah, in future, we'd like to do some more handling of dynamic config files. They also use cheated templating, so a better solution for that. 
Also like to identify mutually exclusive arguments, um, looking more at the select params in the galaxy uh, and just an improved cheetah passing in general. And we'd also like to pass all of the galaxy tools, uh, their tests, and then do the translation, build a test suite, run those tests to make sure that those translated tools are valid. And that's really good because we have metrics then. We can tell you, okay, how is it 80% of the time the tool's runnable, 50%, 90%, that kind of thing. So yeah, in summary, hope that we can help connect the work for this space. Um, and really something that I, I want out of this is exposing new users to Galaxy and especially people who, for example, only use Nextflow, get them to start in Galaxy, write the workflow and then translate at the end. Thanks. Thank you, Grace. Amazing talk. Maybe one really, 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 really quick question here, I think. We've got two, but we'll just choose one. I mean, that was really amazing. Thanks a lot. Um, I guess I have one question. I mean, so your approach of um, rendering cheetah uh, templates is really cool. I mean, uh, one thing I, I thought immediately, like, do you think we can sort of embed that in the backend to, um, as the user changes parameters, render the command line that will be run? Because it's not, it's not super easy to tell just by changing the parameters which command line is running, but like papers often say, well, use the dash Y option with 33 or something. And like, well, which one is it? Because you've got to find it in the Galaxy interface. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that, um... I'm not gonna stand here and say, yeah, we should change the way tools are written. I don't think that that's like really particularly viable. I think that if anything, we just need to be a bit clever about how we pass this kind of structure. That said, yeah, um, I should actually add on to this as well. Something we wanted to do, maybe it could play into this in some way. We were thinking about putting Janus Translate as an actual tool on Galaxy. So instead of having to like Docker pull or pip install Janus, you can just run Janus in Galaxy. So maybe there's a way that we can work that in there. I know, I mean, maybe some analysis. Just a tiny uh, additional question. Um, you mentioned going from Galaxy to Nextflow. Um, how far is like, I mean, how, I mean, basically I'm asking the other way around, like, can you go from Nextflow back to Galaxy and like, where, where are you with that? We don't have Nextflow in just yet, but if there's enough interest, we'll add that. Yeah. Thank you. Let's thank Grace once again. Thank you so much. And our next speaker is, uh, sorry if I pronounced this correctly, Katazania. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Most of you know me as Kasia. Hi. <laughs> and I will talk today about uh, fair data stewardship in Galaxy. So whoever visits my poster, you know that I'm very excited about the fair. And first stands for findable, accessible, interoper interoperable, and uh, reusable uh, data or research. Uh, it's not. Yes. So, what our goals are uh, in terms of FAIR, we would like to develop a data management training which will be addressed to everyone and supports everyone in a way of, uh, of reproducible science. And also, we would like to embed existing training and help people improve. I'm, I think I'm maybe too loud. <laughs> we want to improve uh, everyone's research experience. Is it? Carry on. Yeah. Uh, I have only short talk and I can talk for hours. So let's wrap it up. So uh, we already developed a set of uh, training materials available through uh, Galaxy Training Network. So if you're interested, go there and have a look. Uh, they addressing very basic stuff, focusing on fair in a nutshell and also fair data management solutions for people who are writing grants, publishing and are super involved in data. So we are trying to address whole scope of audience and also how you can improve your existing Galaxy training materials. So shout out to Helena and Saski for constantly improving the training network. 
And uh, we also have uh, our own community in the UK. So if you visited my poster, you're already aware that we are having a Fair Data Stewardship Fellowship and 24 fellows from 17 organizations. What is cool about that, that our guys are focusing on different data and on different, different areas of expertise. So we have people from climate, from agriculture, from chemistry. So they have, they, they have, they overcome different uh, issues with, uh, with fairness and data. So what is the whole verification process? What we can do about uh, our data and then training essentially is uh, we constantly see publications or uh, or data released with a lacking unique identifiers or lacking proper metadata and uh, even you know stored somewhere which is not really reusable and uh, it's not possible for a secondary data use uh, and we would like to highlight uh, the opportunities which and what can be done within the existing uh, data or the training so uh, hopefully uh, you you are aware of, of our fair research section and uh, you can find out more there uh, where is where is material provided by us and uh, amazing rock rates team and yeah uh, hopefully uh, you you can come and talk to me after the <laughs> uh, after the talk and uh, I think I fit perfectly in time so we have time for questions. Thank you. We do. Any questions? If you have data and you don't know what to what to do with them, or if you have existing training and you would like some expertise on that. Yeah, we. Svenning's going back to back with two talks, and we're going to have questions at the end of each one if we have time. So, without any further ado, please take it away. Thank you. Um, so, my first talk is called Accessing and Processing Sensitive Data in a Public Galaxy Server. So, this is the output of an implementation study that was now finishing. Um, which is called strengthened data management in Galaxy. This is one small part of a larger project. Um, and the, the work package two is the one which was about sensitive data. Um, and this talk is mainly about the output of the first task, which is named encrypted data processing. Uh, but I need to say a bit about the second task, but I will not talk so much about that in detail. So, um, and this is about the data access where, where do the sensitive data come from um, and uh, the integration with the ega which is the european genome film archive in its central form and also in its federated form um, so a few words about that so there is this um, uh, project that is very uh, hot now in europe which is called the federated european genome film archive uh, which is based upon the existing EGA, which has been in, in uh, I don't know exactly when it started, but it's, it's been there for, for years, in two locations, in the UK and in uh, Spain, in Barcelona. Uh, the problem is that legal uh, restrictions to sensitive data and then to, well, your personal genomes uh, are often, at least in Norway and most places, and they're not allowed to be shared outside the countries. So um, it's not really a solution to provide them to, to UK or Spain. Uh, so instead, there's this federated um, system, which is set up with a database in each country. Um, and this works so that the data itself is only available um, in the country while the metadata is shared so that you can search across uh, and if you find anything interesting, you can then apply for access and then get direct links to, to get the data if, if it's granted. Um, and also a bit proud that Norway is the first node that was uh, officially signed this collaboration agreement. Uh, but there are also others coming and I don't know exactly who has signed it. Um, yeah, it's also part of this large EU funded project called the Genomic Data Infrastructure. I see I need to speed up here. Uh, 
Okay, so there is already some, some tools. Um, you might have even developed them for downloading data from EGA. Um, the one thing that's important here is that these tools assume a private Galaxy installation. So they decrypt the data uh, and have them available in Galaxy in, in decrypted form, um, which is fine if one has that, but uh, then you sort of have one installation per project and you have to have a security infrastructure for the Galaxy. Um, so when this project will be looked at different scenarios, uh, one of the scenarios is exactly this. We have a single private Galaxy server um, or a variant of that to have one Galaxy server per user project within an infrastructure that supports that. Um, and then the Scenario number two, which is the most difficult one, is how can one manage to do this also in a public setting? Uh, so we decided to focus on that one, because if we can solve that one, at least the other ones are, should be easier to solve. <laughs> so let's go to the most difficult one. Um, that has some consequences, and this, this is already in the task. So you would need some, for, some form of data encryption at the user level, so that every user can encrypt data uh, for use of that uh, uh, specific use. Um, and also some sort of management. Actually, that part, uh, we don't really need that much in Galaxy that happened to fall out a bit. Um, this is based on a standard from uh, the Global Alliance for Global Health, which is called Crypt4GH, um, which sort of makes all of this possible, really. Um, Pulsar, uh, we need to consider, um, and also proof of concept implementations. So this was the, the tasks, task goals. Uh, a few words about who we can trust um, in this setting. Uh, that sort of sets the scope of uh, solution. So the one thing that we definitely can trust is the data provider. So that is the AGS would be officially approved in different countries and the authentication authorization is, is, is there. That's sort of assumed to be safe. Uh, the other thing that we do assume it, that we trust here is the user's local computer environment. It's not that it necessarily is secure, but it's sort of out of the scope. It, it is the responsibility of the user to do that. So, uh, and that's also part of the game. When the user can get data from EJ, it is assumed that the user are able to keep that data safe. So, so that's sort of out of scope. Um, and the compute environment. So we want to be able to do sensitive data analysis uh, distributed way, right? Um, so we assume then that the environment is safe. So this is not into detail of exactly how to set up that environment. Um, and also that these three ABC, that there is a safe way to authenticate and exchange keys between them. Um, so it's not going into the authentication issues that, that's sort of outside the scope here. So who do we not trust? Um, well, the internet, obviously. Um, we also do not trust the Galaxy code base, sorry to say that. Um, there has been some security holes and there probably still lots, I don't know left. We cannot, when we talk about sensitive data, we cannot really trust Galaxy Codebase. And the Galaxy admins, sorry, <laughs> we cannot trust you either. <laughs> um, at least not trusting you should make your lives easier though. Uh, tools and workflows, uh, we don't really trust them, but we, some, some, this is out of scope, but, but we need to have established some trust um, some certification mechanism, something that's sort of out of scope. Let's assume that this is there. Um, and also the, that compute should be shielded from internet so that it sort of doesn't share your data while it's running. That sounds cool. Um, right. Okay, so where we started with this is, is the issue of private, this is a private public key pair issue, and you would need to. Uh, at least we thought that we would need to share their private key somehow um, because the private key is needed for decrypting of the data from EGA. So we looked into the issue of could we use the Galaxy Vault for that? Um, 
because we would need to give Galaxy the way of access to the data. That's what we thought. Um, we decided that in any case, even though this would be a rather secure solution, that giving away the private key is still less secure than not. So we looked, ended up looking into the uh, other idea, if, what, what if the user do not share a private key at all? So that the private key will remain on the computer or, or user environment uh, all time and it's not shared to anyone. Um, and it uh, actually crypt 4 gauge provides a solution for that. Um, so basically you can, can re-crypt data sets and you don't have to take the whole data set. You can just uh, re-crypt a small header and that header contains uh, keys that can use to, use to decrypt the rest of the data set. Um, and then there's two different ways of that that can happen in Galaxy. One is to do that decryption inside the browser in the front end, um, or one can do it in the back end. Okay, I've got a little timer. This is what we came up with. This is a quite complex thing. Uh, um, oh, that's right. So let me take me through this in super speed. Data import, um, as I mentioned, um, sensitive data is available. This is sort of already set up in the uh, FIGA system. Um, there's this header which is uh, re-crypted for a specific public private key pair. So the user provides a public, public key which comes in on top pair and uh, it's then the header is decrypted so that the only user with the user's private key can decrypt this. Um, then we, there is, needs to be some crypt for gh support in Galaxy. We have added, uh, or it's not, it's, it's just a, uh, yeah, we added a, a crypt for gh specific data set. Um, and the way we solve this is that this header is, is then provided in the metadata. So the data set in Galaxy remains the same, uh, while you can change the metadata header and recrypt that, and that is, is uh, secure. Um, and then on the user side, um, we have designed a way that we can set up a REST server that runs locally, um, and which provides the recryption. So basically Galaxy talks to the locally running REST server, asks, can you recrypt this data set? Um, and everything that is connected to the keys happen, the private keys happen and locally, it's not shared through Galaxy at all. Um, yeah, so in order for this to work, then the public, you now the, the recruiter service needs to have access to the public key of the compute node. And there's the need for a key server that does that exchange. I'm not going to detail all that now. Um, how would that work in the user interface? So this is the one way that could work. Uh, and you have a functioning working prototype of this. So basically we just added a small key icon, um, which then starts this request to the local recryption service and recrypts to the compute node that's configured then locally. Uh, um, and you get them um, recrypted meta header, which is added back to the data set. You get a new data set, but it's just the same, pointing to the same data set on, on disk, just changing this header. And also there's also then the, uh, an expiration date of that key. So after a certain while, it will stop working. And then in the secure uh, node, uh, the data sets are decrypted, you execute the job in, in the containers as usual, and it's then in, encrypted again for the encryption of the user's private key, and, and then the user's private key is already there in, in the compute node in, uh, with the key server, which is, is not really shown here. It's shown there, it's, it's not easy to see. Um, we have yet to find the best way to set this up in Galaxy, so we need some help with, with the figuring out that, I mean, 
So we can set up like pre and post processing, perhaps that does the decryption and encryption. Um, but how to do that and how to do that uh, across job runners, we're not really sure. So that's something that we need help with. But I mean, it is definitely doable. Uh, and also the question is also how to manage the intermediate data sets within here. I mean, this should not be any traces left. Um, but this also assumed to happen inside the secure compute. So finally, once this is done, the output is then encrypted and the user is the only one that has the key to decrypt it and it can download the data sets and um, decrypt the outputs. Or alternatively can recrypt again for a new round, a new analysis, just starting from the scratch basically. So limitations is that visualizations will not be available, which is probably quite large limitation. One could probably figure out ways to do that, but that's a bit yeah, difficult. So it's out of scope or you know, this project, um, possibly within the client, possibly with some sort of terminal system. Um, yeah, also this is more detail on the key server, but I'll skip that now. It's 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 too much details anyway. But it's there if you want to look at that later. Um, yeah, here's the acknowledgments and logos. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We've got time for one question before we start with the short talk. Thank you. Um, there are a number of standards when it comes to key management. Um, so uh, this FIPS um, uh, variety, which one do, do you satisfy? Um, we have not looked into that. Uh, so, but basically, uh, so the key server is, in our proof concept is just a simple uh, Python thing. But but um, you could put proper key management uh, systems there, possibly. But I mean that we haven't looked at detail on how to do that. Thank you. All right, we might get your talks, your slides for your short talk up now. Yep. Uh, while we're doing that, does any of that work help with the reverse of uploading to Phenome Genome? Was going to make that process any easier from personal experience? Sometimes it's not. Um, I haven't really thought about that, but, but uh, possibly, yeah. Possibly it can, yeah. But, uh, I have to think about it. <laughs> That's enough for now. We'll yeah. over All right, on to your short talk, please. OK, so over to something completely different. Um, and the wildcard tyranny embrace path-based interactive tools. This is a bit of a call to arms or something, not arms. Um, OK, so this is an issue uh, which has been here for a long time. And everybody who has been working with interactive tools to, or developing interactive tools uh, or uh, administering knows probably a bit about this. Um, so the issue in brief is that interactive tools in Galaxy, they are really, really cool. However, they are difficult to deploy, which hinders their adoption and availability. Um, and there's a technical issue for this. I'll go a bit into detail here. Um, so the issue is that every interactive tool instance, every time you start a tool, you get a specific URL, which needs then to be routed to the corresponding container, Docker container that, that runs the actual tool. And the uh, first solution to that problem uh, is to have this in the subdomain. So, so you have some, it's not like exactly like this, but, but you have some then uh, uh, hash, hash uh, things that's put in the beginning of the domain. Um, and you need to map that to the actual container. Um, and this is done in two steps. So first you have a web server proxy from like an Nginx running on your server, which maps it to this uh, service called the Galaxy ET proxy. And that server then maps this specific hash into a specific container, a specific port that runs, runs that. So uh, this is sort of how, how it's been working all the time, more or less, I think. Um, the problem with this is that it requires something called a wildcard DNS certificate. So um, in order to secure the connection, um, you have this DNS certificates and this needs to be of a wildcard type. Basically, you can have anything.mygalaxy.org, for instance. 
Uh, problem with that is that these certificates are inherently less secure than normal ones uh, because it allows attackers basically to set up subdomain servers if they're able to reach the system and they will look very, very safe to users because of the domain, I mean, this will look like a real, real uh, URL. So many admins do not like that at all. Um, and many institutions do not allow the use of wildcard DNS certificates at all, um, which is not good for attractive tools. It's also a bit clumsy setup. It is not sort of a bit out of the ordinary way and, and often admins drop supporting this completely. The alternative is to have a path-based uh, URLs. So instead of having these uh, uh, hash numbers in the beginning, you add them after some uh, slashes in the path. Um, and that was introduced in 2019 or thereabouts. Uh, and basically there, there was two steps of that, a transformation from this way of providing URLs into the subdomain way that happened in the UWSKI context, and then the same proxy that was there. Uh, this unfortunately stopped working, and it's also hidden. I don't know if many people knew about it, but, but in any case, it stopped working when we replaced Uwiski with Unicorn. Uh, so uh, I have then, then make, made that work again by, um, first, first solution was just to provide a similar setup using Nginx instead of Uwiski, but this would then require an extra sort of web server on top of, on top of uh, Uwiski. Um, so especially for development, it's not really a good solution. Um, that's the first solution. And then the second solution, which is now part of the latest Kelsey release, is um, to also support path-based URLs in Galaxy IT proxy, um, which is now there and this now works out of the box. Uh, the problem is that there's only two of the tools, all the tools that are there, at least the ones I tried, I just made two of them work with this, and so uh, Open Refine and the Ubuntu desktop. All the others you know, crash and burn or something. Um, the, it's very easy to, to test this, you just set this requires domain, which is a tag in the tool XML, set it false, try to run the tool, and if it works, it works, but it's just those two. Um, the problem is that there's a, typically a web server in, inside the um, uh, Docker container, um, and that might not uh, be set up for to allow anything. I mean, if all the links in uh, sort of the pages are relative, it should work, and that's probably the way it is in these two. Um, but otherwise, typically you would need to configure the uh, container with the correct path. This is the path you served under, and that will, I believe, in most cases, solve the situation. It might not solve everything, but I think it will solve the majority of the situations. Uh, so first, we need to find out, okay, for every time you run it, this is the URL you run under, and provide that to the tool, and you need to configure the tool, and that this needs to be done on per, per tool basis. So it's uh, quite a bit of work, but not very much. It's, it's sort of it's doable, but uh, uh, one needs to go together and actually try to do this and, and solve this problem. So this is where I end. Can we, in this co-fest, come together and try to make at least some but perhaps also all the interactive tools work with path-based URLs. I will be here and I'll try to help you figure out how to do this. Um, I just need people that are uh, interesting in, in uh, joining this effort. And finally, for this session, I'd like to introduce Soyan, who's going to give us two short talks. Hi. Uh... My name is Soyan, and I work at the Center for Infectious Disease Genomics and One Health. Uh, so we're about 25 people and growing. We're based in uh, uh, Burnaby, British Columbia. I'd like to uh, say thank uh, my son, Hawk, who actually helped me uh, put this presentation together with this uh, magic of video editing. He's uh, joining online due to a uh, very complex laundry-related issue. 
Um, I talk, I spend a lot of my time talking to people, like people at the Ministry of Health, people at the Health Authority, uh, privacy officers, governor's officers. Why? Data access. So data uh, sharing turned out to be a very complicated problem. Just to give you an example of some of the projects we're actually doing to tackle this issue, trusted uh, execution environment. Uh, so some of you uh, spoke to the, uh, the need for creating a secure research environment. So I, I have led uh, the creation of a secure cloud environment in partnership with the three of the health authority in BC. Um, another big challenge is mapping related issue. So different research groups uh, are using different terminologies, ontologies, and how do we ensure that the, uh, we can talk to other people? There's an interoperability between different research groups. To take it even further, how can we create interoperability between research community to uh, a clinical community, for example? So I'm working with the global standards organization, such as LSS 7 and FIRE. Um, to make sure that there's an interoperability between the two issue. That's a mapping related issue, which is my next presentation, not this one. So this presentation, I like to focus on privacy, which is a massive challenge. I believe that researchers, we all have responsibility to manage the data well, to mitigate any potential harm for privacy. Um, good news is that there's this emerging community who are working on privacy, so privacy enhancing technology, which is what my presentation is about. So I have only 10 seconds to talk about, I'll, I'll uh, define the problem space and I'm actually gonna play a video. Um, the K, who's uh, my collaborator, so that's Samsung SPS, who has worked with us uh, to solve this problem. So the use case for us is this current Shigella outbreak, and then we're finding that the genome-only clustering is too broad. So we're finding that uh, by accessing broader sets of contextual data that are associated with the sequencing, we can do analysis that's much more powerful. But it's been very difficult to gain access to a lot of sensitive information for broader contextual data, especially coming from the hospital. So uh, using Beacon, now this is where Galaxy comes in. So Galaxy has integrated with uh, Beacon. I believe the latest version is B2. So we have a way to easily search and find the data. So once that initial contact is made to really find out who has the data that you're looking for, how do you go about accessing broader uh, sets of data who may be sensitive? So that's where the uh, technology such as PSI could come in. Uh, PSI stands for private set intersection. So hopefully this gives you a flavor of uh, a different type of privacy uh, preservation technique. The traditional uh, technique for privacy preservation often assume that if you uh, gain access to data, you have to see the data. So this gives you a different perspective of what if you can compute on the data without seeing the data. Hi everyone, this is Kyo Han from Samsung STS Research. I will present about private intersection, which is used in our demo for privacy. I'm sorry that I cannot attend the conference offline. Let's start with definition of private intersection for short PSI. PSI is cryptographic protocol to get intersection without revealing each party's input. Suppose two institutions want to know about some information on intersection between two data sets in each party. Each, if they don't want to share their data set to opposite, PSI can be used. Actually, the PSI is not just for the intersection. There are various variants of PSI, which are PSI cardinality, PSI sum, and circuit PSI. PSI cardinality is to compute the size of intersection and does not reveal any information except the size. PSI sum is to compute the summation of values which are corresponding to the intersection. 
And circuit PSI is general protocol to support arbitrary computation on the intersection. At this point, some audience may be curious about how PSI can be used in real world applications. Intersection itself is powerful computation than expected. Many questions in real world applications can be represented using intersection. For example, if two companies want to know about how many customers are in common, they can use PSI cardinality with each company's customer list. If a web browser user wants to know about are there bridged password that I'm using, PSI between passwords saved in web browser and bridged password database can answer the question without revealing any personal information. For this reason, PSI is already used in various systems like Microsoft Edge, Google Chrome, and Apple's PSI system for users' privacy. In addition, the performance of PSI is improved a lot. For example, I think I'm gonna I have running out of time here. So fast forward to our use case using Shibiela. Uh, at each party. Decide cardinality to get the answers. This is a recorded video of our demo. First, we can see the CSV file at each party with proper command including name. Okay, I've uh, kind of ran out of time. So I guess the key message is here is that uh, the privacy is very important. As it's an uh, important area uh, for research as well. Uh, for those of you who would like to learn more about the privacy enhancing technology, like I said, there's a broader community who's working to tackle this problem. Um, so UN uh, Privacy Enhancing Technology Lab is one example of that, which I'm part of. So, and Samsung, Samsung SDS is uh, part of that uh, consortium as well. So uh, please uh, do get in touch for those who are interested in learning more about uh, this privacy uh, preservation area. Thank you. So this one is uh, another topic related to data access and data sharing. So I, I spoke a little bit about the importance of mapping. Um, and I believe standardization is truly powerful. So I just came from uh, the MedInfo conference and interacted with a lot of people, uh, global standard organizations, uh, FIRE and LG7. And I was just speaking with some of you about uh, creating research repository uh, and uh, implementing FIRE's specification to enable ease of interoperability between the research uh, and research folks and research data, and then the clinical data, which is really the primary source uh, for, for some of you who are working in the healthcare sector. So there's been a lot of mapping exercise and work that's been done to date. Um, the Seneca, I uh, worked as part of work group three so Seneca Working Group 3 pushed out a lot of products uh, related to data mapping. Uh, so this is to enable harmonizations of cohort metadata for human curation purposes. So a lot of uh, NLP related uh, product, data standardization and specifications. And then it works with the beacon in terms of uh, searching data and discover those data. So there's a lot of work that uh, you could uh, uh, leverage uh, for, for this community. So in terms of mapping pipeline, imagine you have a cohort data description, and then uh, there are relevant entity you can identify within your cohort. Imagine you can map them easily to other relevant uh, research work through ontologies. And uh, there's a standardization and consensus in terms of how to describe things. Um, there are four different NLP models that's been developed to really enable and automate this data mapping uh, processes to enable interoperability between different research work. So uh, Zuma and the SORAs are created by EBI, the, uh, the European uh, Bioinformatics Institute. Black's Mapper is developed by uh, our institute at uh, Simon Fraser University. This is currently adopted by FDA for, uh, to, to, to use for foodborne related uh, surveillance. So this is uh, another video, I might have to cut this short. Uh, so we have Izu uh, from EBI. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit about the Zuma as a model. There's the uh, aggregated API. So you can leverage and access this API within uh, Jupyter, for example, within Galaxy. We have a plan to package this tool up within Galaxy and make it available. 
for ease of integration. I'm, I'm curious to see what uh, people might be using this tool for uh, further data standardization and interoperability. SUMA is an ontology annotation tool developed at Embedded BI Spot Team. SUMA is backed by linked data repository of annotation knowledge, which contains curated annotations derived from many publicly available data sources, such as Expression Atlas, Open Targets, and GWAS Catalog. Therefore, SUMA can facilitate, facilitate annotations relating to a diverse range of topics, including disease and phenotype, drug treatments, anatomical component, species, cell type, and more. Furthermore, SUMA can be easily configured to use new data sources or prioritize certain data sources or others to enhance the context sensitivity. As part of Seneca Text Mining Group, we have developed an aggregated text mining API to query each of the models developed by different teams. The API is exposed as a simple web tool and we use to annotate short terms using different models. In this example, we annotate cancer, a short phrase using SUMA and HESO models. They give different ontology based on the knowledge they have. HESO giving UMLS scores most of the time and SUMA giving ontology stored or used in its repository of knowledge. We are also developing a Galaxy 2 wrapper around this aggregated model, so it can be used within Galaxy to annotate terms with concepts and ontologies. Okay. The stuff that I haven't talked about here, it's on the poster if, for those of you who are interested in terms of how to use this aggregated API within Galaxy environment. I have a poster out front and I'm happy to chat further. Um, and uh, yeah, so a little bit of, uh, I guess, promotion that, that this uh, Lax Mapper tool that we have developed to date is currently used by uh, the FDA uh, for their data standardization purposes for foodborne um, disease surveillance. And then also the IRIDA, which is the, the Canadian uh, the, the product uh, used for SARS-CoV-2 surveillance. It's using the data specification enabled by our uh, technology. Lex so that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.